questions? Are you ready? We have lots of questions for you. <laughs> I'll give it my best shot. <laughs> okay. Um, so we will dig in. Um, is lactose intolerance common in EDS? I think my answer to that would state that lactose intolerance is common in worldwide in the adult population. It's such a common finding in general that it is bound to be common in EDS, mainly because we are humans. Um, we don't have any, that I'm aware of, any peer-reviewed literature to suggest that having EDS makes it any more likely for you to be lactose intolerant. So I kind of argue it from the opposite approach is if you are lactose intolerant and you have EDS, it probably makes um, sense to stress even more the avoidance of lactose in your diet. Thank you. And what would you recommend is the best nutrition drink for people unable to consume solid foods for extended periods of time? That is a question I encounter very, very often. And the difficulty in answering that is because we are such individuals, there's no generic answer. Um, the problem with nutrition drinks is we have to hit each of those nutrient classes, including not only proteins, but carbohydrates and fats. It's pretty easy to supply um, carbohydrates and fats that are not allergens because it is mainly proteins that are allergens. But when we get into protein classes, um, many, many people can uh, have poor tolerance for individual protein components. For example, most of the cheapest or most readily available popular uh, protein supplements or supplement drinks in America, we have um, Ensure is a hospital-based one that we see all the time. And when I review the ingredients in that, I would find that very poorly tolerated by a number of my patients because they may have individual intolerance for dairy-based ingredients, for example. So I have to look very closely on a case-by-case -case basis with my patients to say they may tolerate best a hemp protein source or a pea protein source or a strictly vegan protein source. And there are a lot of choices out there. Um, what works well for myself and my family does not necessarily work well for everybody else. Um, one of my favorite uh, brands is called Fruitin, but I would not recommend that for just anybody because it has such a wide variety of plants and herbs in it that um, people have to really do a trial and error to see if they tolerate it. Bottom line is if somebody's not able to eat solid food and has to take a liquid diet, um, that's where it really helps to have them understand that they're not just trying to get calories and they're not just trying to get a certain amount of sugar for energy. Um, it really, unfortunately, has to be a trial and error basis. Great, thank you. And um, if you've had a history of eating disorders and do not want to restrict or eliminate foods because it will compromise your recovery, how do you adapt the advice you're giving? I think that's where uh, a mention of multidisciplinary approach is particularly important. Um, I definitely have a number of patients in my practice that come with a history of an eating disorder. And I just find it most useful to encourage the involved clinicians or a person that has been key to this patient or person's success in overcoming this eating disorder to pick up the phone and speak with me or for me, you know, to give me a name, I'll, I'll pick up the phone and call them. Because again, it's not just as simple as saying, well, I can't restrict my diet. Because bottom line, there are some restrictions that need to be made in order to protect people from having cell mediated responses or antibody mediated responses to foods that they just can't tolerate. So again, it's just, it's the idea of involving the multiple necessary clinicians and coming up with the best strategy on a person by person basis. Thank you. And for those with hypermobile EDS, do you find there's a high prevalence of iron deficient anemia that doesn't respond to oral iron supplementation? In, in my experience, I've, I have a lot of patients who are able to report that they have struggled with iron deficiency anemia. And I, again, I think that's a multifactorial problem. Some of them are struggling with a basic gut inflammation that is affecting um, absorption of multiple nutrients. 
but um, we also can find that the iron source is important. And I see many, many patients whose clinicians have instructed them, take this iron supplement. And the one they are usually recommending is actually a very inexpensive, commonly available iron supplement, either iron sulfate or slow FE we have in America. And I almost always recommend to my patients if they've had little success in addressing the iron deficiency, um, I will recommend uh, ferrous fumarate or ferrous gluconate and making absolutely sure that their uh, vitamin C is, is taken along with it, ideally with food, you know, so that you're not just taking a vitamin C supplement and an iron supplement. If you have to take that iron supplement, it's useful to make sure that you're getting some vitamin C rich foods in your diet or if absolutely necessary, a vitamin C supplement. Thank you. There's so many opinions on anti-inflammatory diets out there, vegan, keto, paleo. Would you say it's trial and error for each individual um, how they tolerate it best? Or do you think that there is a particular anti-inflammatory diet that you feel is best? You know, I think you basically phrased the answer to that question in the question itself. There, there really are so many diets and, and people are coming most diets are defined either by a science approach or an ideology approach. Um, for example, the keto diet is very specifically talking about foods that are going to steer your body from having a, a glucose heavy um, fuel uh, to a ketone body heavy fuel. And there's a lot of science behind that. There's also a lot of science that will tell you that when you switch to that kind of metabolism, there are many people who cannot tolerate it because of the effect ketone bodies have on brain metabolism, and it actually can lead to some very significant psychiatric um, symptoms. When it comes to things like the anti-inflammatory or autoimmune protocol diets, um, they look very much like a paleo diet, and part of that has to do with the science that modern chemistry has introduced chemical ingredients to our diet that really didn't ever exist before. So there's some degree of science behind it. There's some degree of ideology behind it. And when you superimpose a very complicated list of do's and don'ts in a diet onto an individual that is very unique, you know, they have their own nature, their own history of nurture throughout their lifetime that has led to individual issues within their body, um, what I'm usually informing my patients is, is the, a starting ground of basic healthy nutrition that is generally not very inflammatory. And then once you have mastered that, you're starting to recognize the things you can't tolerate. What I find is patients are usually looking for convenience. They want to say, is there a cookbook I can follow or a diet or a list of foods that are okay? And they are usually figuring out when they pay attention to what they feel best eating, that that really very much looks like a ketogenic diet or very much looks like an anti-inflammatory protocol. So they're, they're, there's sort of a circular argument in all of this. I do feel very much it is somewhat trial and error. Thank you. And is uh, turmeric or ginger helpful for EDS or MCAS? So there is some existing literature that is looking in a much more scientific fashion at um, things such as turmeric or ginger. And first I'll respond regarding turmeric. Turmeric is the whole plant or the whole root of the plant. Um, and that is a staple ingredient that has been around for millennia, if not you know longer ge uh, geologic time periods. Um, it's a key ingredient in many um, Asian continent foods, um, curries, um, spices. It's been studied scientifically because so many people have felt relief from pain symptomatology and some of the immune and inflammatory uh, issues. And what we've distilled it down to in scientific terms is talking about curcuminoids or curcumin, which is the acti most active ingredient from um, turmeric. And what has been noted is when you combine curcumin with piperine, which is the most active bioingredient from black pepper. So we see people shredding their turmeric, grating their turmeric into a, you know, a cooking pan, 
um, adding an oil and then adding black pepper to it as, a, as sort of a start of many recipes for foods pe people have been eating for millennia. And science is telling us, wow, okay, we, what we've realized is the curcuminoid molecule and the, pi the piperine molecule um, are lipophilic, so they need that fat or oil with it, which may be oil or lard, um, in the foods that people were eating. Um, and with rigorous study, uh, we have found that there seems to be some bioactive uh, properties of those molecules that are helpful for inflammatory problems, including arthritis and other inflammatory conditions. Unfortunately, what we find is some people cannot tolerate the piperine. They're allergic to black pepper. So that piperine, which is uh, sort of what I've heard written was it sort of knocks on the door of the cell membrane in order to allow the curcumin in to do its work. We find that not everybody can take the benefit of that marriage between piperine and curcumin. Um, when it comes to ginger, ginger is more um, recognized um, in the nutritional community or the medical community as sort of a whole food effect. It's very commonly used for things like it's very safe for for example, a pregnant woman who has nausea. So we can see where that would start to be offered as um, helping our EDS patients who struggle with nausea. I'm not as aware of rigorous studies regarding the use of ginger as I am of curcumin. I just don't see that as heavily as a pill-based supplement. Um, lastly, I think what I'd say is uh, people who are taking a pill of turmeric are not getting as much benefit as if they would cook with turmeric or they would um, turn to the much more regulated and carefully measured out curcumin supplements. Thank you. And, and I think we're coming up to the, one of the last questions. Can gastroparesis and EDX wax and wane? So can you go in and out of flares, um, won't be fine one day and, and terrible the next? Um, this is where I am wishing that um, Dr. Aziz was here, but um, from my personal experience um, caring for patients who do struggle with gastroparesis, I would say that is absolutely true, especially the more that their day-to-day -day routine varies. And I think what I stress with my patients struggling with gastroparesis is this is where food journaling and journaling of what is varying in their life from day to day may help them to recognize triggers that tend to worsen their gastroparesis. And are there any extra complications to look out for for, for celiacs who also have EDS? Um, I'm, I'm not sure that I would stress that as extra complications. I would just underscore that it is so particularly pertinent for us to recognize if a person has both EDS and celiac sprue or celiac disease, that it becomes that much more imperative for them to understand uh, the nature of the foods that they need to avoid. Uh, for example, stressing that it's gluten is not just in wheat, that gluten is a cross-reactive molecule that we can see in oats, rye, barley, and other foods, um, that it, it I can't really say there's extra complications. It's just that we're seeing that because uh, celiac sprue is affecting that um, both the epithelial membrane in the gut, as well as having these extra intestinal systemic manifestations, you know, we're already we already see those problems in EDS. So we're we're seeing a one-two punch for these people. And the last question: How can people lose weight if they need to safely? Again, this is a, a cue for a multidisciplinary approach. Um, it is most important for people to have a clinician at least involved in making sure that any restrictive diet that they're using with a goal of weight loss is nutritionally complete and that if there are missing uh, or you know, nutrient deficiencies that they need to be addressed. But it becomes difficult to incorporate both diet and exercise for weight loss if a person has a restricted diet and doesn't have enough fuel or energy to fuel their exercise goals. Um, I would see this as a multidisciplinary approach between uh, perhaps a nutritionist, a physical therapist, or bariatric specialist clinician, and the person's primary care clinician. Thank you.
Okay, well, that's all we've got time for. Thank you so much for taking all those questions, Dr. Collins, as always. Um, and if there were any questions we didn't get to, please contact our helpline as indicated in the chat. And I'm now gonna hand over to uh, Dr. Alan Hakeem for the next session. Thank you.